Meeting Martin Scorsese was like encountering a soulmate. The chemistry was instantaneous and seemingly lifelong. They would make five films together over the next 20 years and their names would forever be associated with each other. According to Keitel, Marty and I discovered when we met and became friends that we shared a very similar life. It didn't matter that I was raised Jewish and that Marty was raised Catholic, our place was beyond local religion. The meeting took place one day late in 1965. While reading the casting notices in the trade papers backstage show business, Keitel came across an ad seeking actors for a student film at New York University. Scorsese, then a film graduate student at NYU, had put together funding to make a student film, which would eventually grow into his first feature release, Who's That Knocking at My Door? He asked Keitel back to read for the role a second time, then called him back a third time, before finally casting him as the lead in this film. Who's That Knocking at My Door? was filmed over the course of many years, undergoing many changes in different names along the way. The film began in 1965, called Bring on the Dancing Girls. In 1967, the romance plot with Zena Buffin was introduced and spliced together with the earlier film, and the title was changed to I Call First. This version of the film received its world premiere at the Chicago International Film Festival in November 1967. The role, J.R was an alter ego for Scorsese, a young man in Little Italy trying to find direction in his life, even as he kindles a romance with a young woman he meets, known only as the girl and played by Zena Buffin by earnestly explaining his love of John Wayne. They become romantically involved, but he cannot bring himself to have sex with her. When she confides to him that she had, a short time earlier, been the victim of date rape, he is disgusted. To J.R. The fact that she's not a virgin makes her unacceptable, he must wrestle with his confused and conicting feelings about her and about women in general. His anguish at finding out that the girl is not a virgin is painfully self-centered. How could she do this to him? Keitel brings brilliant opaqueness to the film's key moment, when he decides he can live with her past and tells her so by saying, I forgive you and am willing to marry you anyway. Scorsese shot most of the 35mm footage with a Mitchell BNC camera, a very cumbersome camera that impeded mobility. He opted to shoot several scenes with a 16mm Eclair NPR camera in order to introduce greater mobility, then blow up the footage to 35mm. For Keitel, mightily frustrated by the limitations of court stenography, the chance to make a movie seemed like his ticket to the big time. In the film Keitel looks so impossibly boyish, that it's easy to forget he was almost 30 when he made it. For Keitel, part of the pleasure lay in his ability to plug in so completely, almost automatically, to Scorsese's vision. It was right there when we met. I was asking myself the same questions he was. What is courage? What is fear? The ultimate fear is of being adrift, abandoned and not being able to cope with it. One's ability to cope with these darker elements will determine the heights one will reach. The heights for who's that knocking at my door, included frequent trips to the depths as well, as funding for the film came and went. Everyone had other jobs, so shooting was done on weekends. Harvey was very upset because he was working as a court stenographer and we were wasting his time, Scorsese recalled. Zena Buffoon, who was 19 at the time, had been working as an actress since childhood. She met Keitel at a screen test and found him a little shy. He struck me as a very sweet individual, a very dear person. The film was shot during the frigid 1966 winter. Harvey had a kind of unsureness that worked for the character. The character is totally unsure and not able to come to terms with anything because everything doesn't fit in his puzzle, which is what the character is about. Harvey had those qualities sitting right on him. That whole first scene, with the discussion of the magazine and John Wayne, was totally improvised. There was no script. Martin created an environment in a scenario and wanted it to evolve. Harvey seemed to go with that mode and never questioned it. It was exciting but unnerving. According to Scorsese, Harvey pays scrupulous attention to the smallest detail of a role and is always intensely supportive of the project as a whole. 
between the pauses in filming and the extended process of editing and then selling the film, it was 1968 before Who's At Knocking At My Door saw the light of day at the Carnegie Cinema. Scorsese had found Joseph Brenner, a distributor of skin films, who offered to buy the picture and distribute it on the condition that a sex scene be added to give the film sex exploitation angles for marketing purposes. Scorsese shot and edited a technically beautiful but largely gratuitous montage of J.R. fantasizing about betting a series of prostitutes, shot in Amsterdam, the Netherlands with a visibly older Kyle. The song used in the sex scene montage by Martin Scorsese is The End, a song by The Doors, written by Jim Morrison. The audience, however, was small for this gritty black and white story of a confused young man in New York. Harvey was excited. We were all excited when it opened, but we were disappointed because we expected a lot more than it delivered. Brenner recalled. Harvey as an actor forced to support his art by working as a court stenographer. He'd already taken some steps toward creating this new life. Rufus Collins, a black actor with whom he had studied, had told him. Harvey, you'll never be an actor unless you leave Brooklyn. So he'd moved into a Greenwich village on Bedford Street, which he later traded for a tiny apartment in Hell's Kitchen. But Keitel still needed to make the separation from the courtroom job, which had become both a lift jacket and an anchor in his life. It took me five years to really commit myself to be an actor, he said. He recalled landing a spot among hundreds of extras playing a soldier in John Huston's sexually ambiguous reflections in A Golden Eye, which starred one of his idols, Marlon Brando. He also began working at regional theaters on the East Coast. Though he was nearing 30, he was frequently cast in juvenile roles, playing the son in Frank Delroy's volatile family drama, The Subject Was Roses, at the Pittsburgh Playhouse in 1968, and one of the menacing teenagers in Israel Horovitz's The Indian Wants the Bronx at the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut, as he was about to turn 30. For Arvin Brown, who directed the Long Wharf production, Keitel relied on a tremendous natural energy and brought menace to the stage, but also innocence, no matter how decadent, how violent, how disturbing the world he moves in, that's the one quality that's remained a constant. Keitel was very open and still an experience, eager for direction. And he was willing to try anything, a trade that would become a trademark. He was an actor in the midst of learning his craft, and of learning the importance of the craft itself. He may have had presence, but he had still not developed his voice for the stage. One of the acting problems he had to combat at the start was that he was limited vocally. That's why film was a great medium for him from the beginning. Zena Buffoon remembered that, during the filming of Who's That Knocking At My Door, Keitel seemed to be in a stage of evolving. I got the sense he was searching for what kind of actor he was, searching for an identity. For a long time. Though he loved the sense of emotional freedom and expression acting gave him, he tried to convince himself that it was merely a seemingly easy route to riches and fame. If he could convince himself that he was just doing it to make a living, he wouldn't have to face the fact that it was the most important thing in the world to him. He began to feel that all the risks he had taken had been worthwhile when he began studying at the actor's studio with Lee Strasberg. Working with Strasberg opened his eyes to what acting could be about if you thought about it and applied yourself. According to actor Ron Silver, who shared the Strasberg classes with Keitel. When Strasberg taught, what he was saying always seemed so simple. Like you almost didn't know whether to take him at his word. At the same time, he could be very abstract. He'd say, just be, just exist for a minute, just have a real moment. Some pupils took what he said to an extreme. He was never one for indulgence, never one to dispute a director's authority. He was never someone who would insist on substituting his own truth for the character for the playwright's truth. At the same time, you also had to have respect for the actor as the author of the authenticity of the life. The bulk of the teaching focused on sensory work as it applied to doing scenes. The idea was to work on each of the five senses, to teach the actor to expand on his imagination, to be personal in the work by drawing upon his own experiences to revisit the emotions comparable to ones being felt by the character. The emotions, Keitel was taught, were already there. Now he had to learn to free them when he did the scene. 
it wasn't the same as planning what to do in the scene. Rather, the actor unleashed the emotions and applied them to this character. Keitel was taught to create an imaginary life for the character. The scene was a moment out of that life that was happening now, spontaneously and freely. Harvey is one who loved the process that method by which an actor discovers, develops and comes to embody a character. To Keitel, it became a meticulous regimen involving the various kinds of rehearsal exercises he'd learned, finding a physical key to the person as well as an interior emotional design. This is my way of working, but it's not as if I made it up myself. It's part of the way acting is taught now in New York, based on the Stanislavski system. It's part of the teachings to fill the part. Doing the homework, for Keitel, means analyzing the script and extrapolating an entire life of the character, a framework in which to set his actions in the script. Stella Adler, who's a great teacher, remarked that the analysis of the text is the education of the actor for him, it became part of the spiritual framework of his life. Acting is religious, he said. Great acting can be worshipped because it descends into the subconscious, into the soul. And somewhere in there must be God. In the spring of 1970, anti-war protests on American college campuses resulted in the killings of four Kent State University students by overzealous Ohio National Guardsmen. The event upset Kyle. When he phoned Scorsese, he learned that anti-war forces were taking over the film department at NYU and making short LMS to be shown on college campuses around the country. So Keitel helped out and even appeared in Street Scenes, the documentary shot that spring during the height of anti-war sentiment. I see the movie we did as more than entertainment, Keitel said, I resolved then to try to choose roles that have social meaning. By the end of 1970 Scorsese, on the strength of his work as assistant director and editor on the movie Woodstock, had moved to Los Angeles. Eventually, Keitel followed him out there and lived with him for a while as he looked for work. But the pickings were slim, both in terms of work and women. No one would go out with either of them, observed one friend from the period, because the women thought they were a couple of losers. By the beginning of 1972 Keitel had moved back to New York, convinced he was going to have to go back to court reporting. Keitel could barely contain his frustration. Acting had been a kind of salvation, one that lifted him spiritually even as it challenged and nourished him intellectually. But he was getting absolutely no encouragement. Then Scorsese called with the news that he had the money and the backing of Warner Brothers to make a movie, and, would Keitel be interested in playing the lead?